You've tuned in to the most crazy rocking metal podcast on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metal from the Inside. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Metal from the Inside podcast, hosted by yours truly, Sydney Taylor. Thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode and joining me for another week. You guys are listening to episode 21, and this is probably one of my very favorite episodes that I've ever had the chance to do. I have a really great interview for you guys this week with the legendary vocalist Robin McCauley of McCauley Shanker Group, of course, as well as Survivor, most recently Black Swan, and he also is a performer in the Vegas show, Raiding the Rock Vault which so many of our favorites have been a part of as well. Robin was such a bucket list interview for me. I love Macaulay Schenker Group. I love those records that they did in the late 80s and early 90s, you know, from Perfect Timing to Save Yourself. The self-titled record as well. I'd probably say that Macaulay Schenker Group is hands down my favorite version of MSG. I know I've also talked about them on the podcast before when I've spoken about some new music, but I absolutely love Black Swan, which is the most recent project that Robin has been a part of. It's a super group that consists of Robin on vocals, Jeff Pilsen from Dawkin on bass and also producing, Reb Beach from A White Snake and Winger, and Matt Starr, who has also done some work with Braiding the Rock Vaults. They just released their debut record back in February uh, of this year before the world kind of went crazy, and it is called Shake the World, ironically enough, and one of my favorite songs off the record is Big Disaster, which pretty much explains the entirety of 2020, and Robin and I really, really get into that in the interview. We talk all about the process of creating the band, what it was like to make the record, um, you know, creating the songs and everything like that. Um, So I really, really think that you guys are going to enjoy this conversation out of all the interviews I've ever done. This is probably right up there as one of my very, very favorites. Robin is just the sweetest guy and he's so talented. Um, He's been working in the industry now for over 30 years and he's just incredible. So I really, really think that you guys are going to enjoy listening to this one. And as always, if you guys want to listen to the podcast or conversation visually, be sure to go to the Metal from the Inside YouTube channel. I am posting all of the interviews on there for you guys to watch. I've been doing a lot of these over Zoom, so I actually have the conversations, um, you know, with our Zoom conversations recorded for you guys to watch. So if you are more of a visual person and would like to watch the interviews that way and see our faces while we speak, be sure to go to our YouTube channel and check it out. But before I get into the interview, as always, I'm here to fill you guys in on everything that's been happening in the hard rock and heavy metal world over the last two weeks. If you guys are hard rock and heavy metal fans, which you are by listening to this podcast, I am sure that you know the sadness that the hard rock community has felt over the last uh, week and a half. We lost the legendary Eddie Van Halen um, innovator. Just there are really no proper words to express just how influential Eddie was to metal, to guitarist from 1978 on. He has inspired generations of players and you know, 40 years later, no one has yet to be able to top Eddie Van Halen. Um, I think it's going to be one of those moments that I look back on and I remember like where I was when Eddie Van Halen died. Um, I was in complete shock when I saw uh, Wolfgang's post on Twitter saying that Eddie had passed away um, from his battle with cancer. You know, Eddie had been battling cancer for over 20 years. You know, it started with tongue cancer and eventually progressed to other things and eventually throat cancer. Um, So he had been battling this for a while now. And I'd heard last year that he wasn't doing very well, and I guess it kind of just went away. We didn't hear a lot. I think I actually remember seeing an article that he wasn't close to death, that it was kind of a rumor, whatever. Um, So that was a year ago, and something that was crazy was it actually popped up in my Facebook memories that I had seen that, you know, Eddie wasn't doing well, and, you know, I was really, really heartbroken that eventually one day I'm going to have to watch, you know, all of the musicians who have influenced me pass away pretty much. And it was almost a year to the day that he actually ended up passing away. But I saw Wolfgang's post and I genuinely, um, for the first time in a long time, was just at a complete loss for words. It didn't feel real. I feel like a lot of these musicians, and I felt this way too when David Bowie died because David Bowie was just so special to me personally, um, you know, when it comes to my childhood and, and my love for music and he was for other people. But with David Bowie and with Eddie Van Halen, you know, these people seem immortal, you know, and in a way they are because, you know, their music will live on forever. But 
you know, them as people, they're so otherworldly in a way that it doesn't seem like they're also human. And, you know, and Eddie Van Halen, who was such an innovator, he completely changed the game of the entire instrument. Um, you know, him and Jimi Hendrix are probably the two that, one of the only two that ever did that, you know. After Eddie Van Halen, not, not a lot of players were as innovative as Eddie. Um, still to this day, like I said, there hasn't been another player that has truly recreated the instrument like Eddie Van Halen did. And it was just really, really hard to process. I actually had heard the news and was just watching it kind of roll in. I feel like I caught uh, Wolfgang's post very, very soon after he shared it. Um, I feel like I was one of the, the first to see it, to be honest. It kind of just came up in my feed and I saw all of the tributes start to roll in and the realization that everybody, you know, had heard that he had passed away and it just did not seem real at all. I kind of had to process it a little bit and I'm still processing it, but uh, I had to go to work and when I when I walked to work, because um, I, I li- you know, live like a 10 minute walk away from my job, but I was walking to work and I was hearing people blasting Van Halen from, you know, their houses and their cars and it was just a very, very surreal moment. Um, and it really, really hit me that, you know, there will never be another Van Halen show. There will never be another Van Halen record. And it's it's a hard pill to swallow. And I think it, it's even tougher that this is just one of many that we're all going to have to go through. I think about the day that Ozzy passes away um, or Tony Iommi or I don't know, name any of these big hitters, Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, Mick Jagger. You know, it's coming a lot sooner than we all think. And I think that this was such a big reminder of that. I try not to think about that just because, you know, for me, I'm, I'm only 20 and I haven't been in this world of rock for as long as a lot of people have. And to me, these people still feel so young. They still feel like they're 20 and 25 and um, it's just not the case. And this is definitely a really tough reminder that that's not the case. But as I said, even though Eddie himself wasn't immortal, his music and the talent that he gave to so many and the inspiration that he gave to so many, I mean, I think about just how many musicians he inspired. There are so many guitar players that I'm a fan of whose music has completely changed my world that maybe would not have picked up a guitar without Eddie Van Halen. Um, so his his music and his talent will forever be immortal and will forever be remembered. I mean, we're still marveling over his talent 42 years later. I saw a video today that was on Loudwire that I'd love to share for you guys to check out if you haven't seen it. It was two guys, you know, on YouTube, it's really a hot thing right now to react to songs you never heard of. And it's really big with rock and metal songs. I see people all the time reacting to Metallica or Megadeth or Slayer it's, you know, a really big thing right now on YouTube, but these two guys reacted to Ain't Talking About Love for the very first time they were listening to this song, and it was incredible to see two people listen to Eddie for the first time because they were just as mesmerized by his playing and that song and that band as, you know, everybody was when it came out, and as much as I was, like I said, I'm only 20. I haven't been listening to this music for 42 years. I wasn't there when it came out, but, you know, listening to Eddie Van Halen, there's truly nothing like it, and he still has that impact on people. It's just, it's incredible. He is truly a legend. He is one of a kind, and it's really hard to process that he isn't here anymore. I'm so thankful that I got to see Van Halen for the first and only time in September of 2015. I saw them at Bethel Woods, which is a venue in Bethel, New York. It was really, really close to where I lived. I grew up in the suburbs of New York, but Bethel's actually where Woodstock took place. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of the area and know that that is where Woodstock took place, but they were doing that tour, that 2015 tour with David Lee Roth, and I never got to see Van Halen with Michael Anthony, which is something that I really wish would have happened. I had heard uh, from a couple of different sources and articles that I read that they were actually planning a reunion with Michael Anthony that was supposed to happen, I believe, back in 2019 before uh, Eddie's health started to decline, and they were in the middle of planning it, and it just didn't end up happening which is so devastating because it just would have been incredible if it did happen. But I never got to see them with Michael Anthony, but I did get to see David Lee Roth and Eddie Van Halen play together, of course, with Alex, and it was incredible. Every day, I'm so thankful that even though I didn't get to grow up in the prime of this music, which is so hard for me to (laughs) accept and be okay with sometimes, that um, I still, you know, have gotten to see these artists and, you know, have 
have just gotten to experience their talent live, and I'm so thankful that I got to see Van Halen at least once, and who knew that that was going to be the very last tour that Eddie Van Halen ever did. So if you are still mourning the loss of Eddie Van Halen like myself, which I'm sure you are, I know that Sirius XM right now has a whole channel dedicated to Van Halen that I believe is up and running. I think it's channel 27, and it's up and running until October 21st. I know a lot of people are asking them to please extend it. I think it would be a great idea if they did, or even make it permanent, because a permanent Van Halen channel on Sirius XM would be such a great thing. So go ahead and ask Sirius XM to keep the channel up and running. That's there for you guys to go ahead and listen to. Be sure to share with us your Van Halen vinyl, your CDs, cassettes, whatever you have. Um, I have so many Van Halen albums on vinyl, and now they are some of my prized possessions. I actually have a colored promo vinyl from 1977 of the first record, and colored vinyl was super not... uh, Uh, common back then, as I'm sure many of you know, Um, and they had some promo records that were sent out to, of course, radio stations and everything, and it's not a full record. Um, It's only a couple of songs front and back, side A, side B, but I have that copy of that vinyl, um, which is so cool for me. Um, It was actually a birthday present a couple years ago, so I have that on vinyl. If you have anything rare or cool that you'd like to share, please feel free to tweet at MFTI official or, you know, me, it's at S. Taylor official, um, your copies of your Van Halen records, and uh, I'd love to see it, you know, continue to pay tribute to Eddie. I've had Van Halen blasting all week, and I don't think that that's going to change. It's just really, really unbelievable. Uh, Also, be sure to share your stories of seeing Van Halen, or if you were there in 1978 when Van Halen released Van Halen 1, you know, let me know the story of what it was like when you heard Van Halen for the first time, because I just think those stories are the coolest. Um, He was just such an innovator. Um, It's just really, really hard to wrap my head around that he is not here anymore. So, Eddie, we love you. Uh, As always, I'm sending love to Eddie's family, you know, his wife, Janie, um, you know, Valerie, which, you know, even though they weren't married anymore, father of her kid and somebody she was married to for almost 30 years. So, I'm sending so much love to her. Again, to Eddie's wife, Janie, and to Wolfgang as well. I think it's so hard to deal with this loss, you know, normally on your own, but to, you know, have millions of other people mourning it as well. um, It's just a whole nother level level of grief that they're dealing with, so I'm sending so much love to them during this incredibly difficult time, and uh, I really, really hope that they're doing okay, but Eddie, we love you. Thank you so much for sharing your gifts and your talents with us. You will live on forever in your music and the influence that you have given so many. You know, I'm sure that there is one hell of a show going on up there. You know, you've got Eddie Van Halen, you've got Randy Rhodes, Lemmy, you just got so many amazing people. I'm sure that there is one hell of a show going on up there, but, you know, rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen. Um, It's just insanity. But on a little bit of a lighter note, there is some other exciting things happening in the hard rock and heavy metal world. Rat is actually back in the studio, and I'm excited to hear whatever this new material will end up being. As we know, Warren Martini left the band, I think at this point, probably a year, year and a half ago. Um, and they haven't really done a whole lot since then. Uh, Jordan Ziff, who is the guitar player for Rat, is in the studio with Steven and Juan, and I really am anxious to see what comes of that and what the sound will be like, if it's going to be classic Rat, if it's going to be something a little bit different. Um, We'll stay tuned and keep you updated. Also, as I talked about on the last podcast episode, we were in a little bit of an unknown area when it came to ACDC's new material, but since then, their single Shot in the Dark has been released. The single has been charting quite well and is right Right up there with Dreams by Fleetwood Mac, which is actually number one on the iTunes chart, which is insane. It went viral due to that TikTok video that's been going around of that guy skateboarding, you know, drinking some Ocean Spray cranberry juice and singing Dreams by Fleetwood Mac. And that guy actually has such a great story. He was on his way to work and his car, his truck actually broke down. So he just left his truck on the side of the road and skateboarded to work and took that video. Um, Since he posted that video, he was given a brand new car and he's had so many donations roll in. And I think that that is just such a great example of social media being used for the better. You know, he wasn't taking that video um, for anything, you know, other than himself. And it kind of just went viral and and struck in the right way. And even, uh, you know, Mick Fleetwood recreated the video and it's just been a whole thing. And now Dreams is back on the charts, which is crazy. 
and Van Halen has been right up there with dreams as well of course due to Eddie's passing you know songs like Running With The Devil, Ain't Talking About Love, Jump, Panama are all back on the iTunes charts. I believe a day or two after his passing I looked on my phone on the iTunes you know charts you can obviously still pay for downloads and Van Halen was the entire screen. They were pretty much every song on the charts you know until like number 15 or something. All of their albums, all of their music videos, it was insane. It was just crazy. It really feels like the late 70s again. You know, you have Dreams by Fleetwood Mac, you have Van Halen, ACDC on the charts again. It is insane. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the only bright spots to come from Eddie's passing is that, you know, we're getting rock back out there. More people are getting exposed to it. More people are discovering it. And it's just insanity. But back to ACDC, they just released, of course, Shot in the Dark and the new record Power Up, uh, which they are citing as a tribute to the late Malcolm Young, who actually did a lot of riff writing um, before his passing that are being used on this new record. Um, so Malcolm is credited on pretty much every single song because he did have a part in writing them. And this album is a tribute to Malcolm and his work. The album Power Up is going to be released on November 13th. So we have more ACDC music on the horizon for us to listen to, which is super exciting. Uh, Shot in the Dark definitely has that classic ACDC feel. You know, even after all these years, they still nail it. It sounds just like the the older records. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of people said that they would have preferred maybe more of a modern sound, but they're a legacy band. They have their sound. They're going to stick to it. They're great at it. And I mean, for me personally, um, I love the sound that ACDC has. And to me, it wouldn't be ACDC without that sound. So I'm totally okay with it sounding like the older records, um, you know, late 70s, early 80s, of course. I think that they did such a great job on that song. And I'm really, really looking forward to listening to the rest of the record. So there's just a lot happening in the hard rock and heavy metal world lately. A lot just taking place, both good and bad. Um... It's just, it's been a crazy couple weeks. It's been a crazy year. And like I said, please feel free to tweet me, to email me, whatever, if you would like to chat Van Halen, whether it's your favorite Van Halen record, your favorite song, your favorite concert memory, your favorite memory listening to Van Halen. I am all about keeping Eddie's memory alive and sharing these stories. So I am totally open to chat if you guys are up to it. Again, I am on Twitter at S Taylor Official, and you guys can email me by clicking the contact tab on the Metal from the Inside website, which is www.metalfromtheinside.com. I just really want to keep Eddie's memory alive and really just share happy experiences and memories in this really, really sad time. I'm so thankful for you guys for listening to what I have to say about Eddie, and uh, I want to hear what you have to say, so be sure to let me know. It is now time to get into this week's interview with one of my very, very favorite vocalists, Robin McCauley. Like I said in the beginning of the episode, this interview was such a bucket list interview for me. I'm so happy to have gotten the opportunity to sit down and speak with Robin. We chat all about Black Swan, the process of getting the band together, as well as what it was like to create this record um, and some of the uh, ideas and inspirations behind some of the songs on the record. We also chat about some of his time in MSG and what it's like for him getting to perform, you know, 30 years later um, and kind of reach so many new generations and people through his music. Um, We really just chat about so much. He is such an insightful musician and person, and he's so, so kind. I am always so honored to be able to sit down and speak with the people who have quite honestly made the music that has changed my life. Um, And sometimes it just hits me that I am so lucky enough to do that. Um, I love Macaulay Shanker Group, and to be able to, you know, sit down and speak with Robin was just such an honor for me, and I never take it for granted. So I'm so happy to be sharing this week's interview with you guys. Like I mentioned before, please go to YouTube. If you'd like to see the interview visually, I have our Zoom call edited and everything for you guys to watch. If you'd like to see our faces while we speak and do the interview, we are of course available on every streaming service as well. If you prefer to listen to your car or on a walk, whatever, we're also available for you to stream that way, of course. So without further ado, I really, really am hoping that you guys love this interview as much as I loved being a part of it. Here is my interview on episode 21 of the Metal from the Inside podcast. 
with the amazing Robin. Hello, McCauley. everybody. Welcome to the Metal from the Inside podcast, episode 21 to be exact. And I know I always say this, but I am genuinely so ecstatic for this week's episode because I have the one and only Robin McCauley, who uh, has done so much over the you know course of his career and is one of my very favorites. So, you know, he's worked with obviously uh, so many different artists. He was in the Macaulay Schenker group, of course, MSG. Um, he is most recently a Black Swan as well. And even throwing it back to some of your earlier works, um, you were in Grand Prix too. So thank wow. you so much for uh, taking the time to speak with me. How are you doing? Good morning, Philadelphia. I am doing fantastic. Thanks for having me on. Great. And before I we get started, coffee. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> big thanks to your wonderful wife, Gina, too, for setting this up. She went above and beyond, and uh, I really appreciate it. She's great. I couldn't do it if she didn't put it together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's great. So really big thanks Thank go you. out to her. Thank you. I'll pass it along. Thank you. <laughs> of course, you know, 2020 has been a crazy year. Um, and I know it was crazy for you starting because you had a little bit of that health scare that you went through. Oh my God, I almost forgot about that. Yes, yes, I did. Yes, I did. And it's behind me. Um, I'll make it really quick because it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's boring. Um, you know, I work a Vegas show. Um, <laughs> I did before this pandemic. Um, and we worked five nights a week with, with a, a show called Radio in the Rock Vault. Right. Uh, running for seven years. And like, I think we've amassed some 1500 shows or something. Anyway. My last show there was March 4th, and I was scheduled to fly to uh, Miami to do the uh, 70,000 tons of metal cruise with uh, Michael Schenkerfest. And um, the day I was expected to fly, I just suddenly started feeling <laughs> extremely cold. Um, it was like 85, 90 degrees out, and I couldn't explain it. And suddenly I my body went into shock. I ended up in the hospital. I turned out I got sepsis from some weird and wonderful place. It seems like I picked up the E. coli virus. I don't know how that happened because I'm usually pretty healthy. Anyway, I was hospitalized for about a week and they poured all sorts of stuff into me and uh, now I'm, I'm fine. It came, you know, it took me about a month to recover. It was like a shocker um, because you know, I, I, I stay pretty healthy, but this thing just, uh, sideswipe me you never know from one day to the next you think everything's rosy and then voila yeah well I was gonna say you recovered um I guess fairly quickly for you know such a, a crazy scare you were back working with rock vault in like a month right you were like back in yeah. February so yeah I came back yeah and uh felt great and uh you know it was scary because I couldn't explain it you know I spoke to my doctors and and they said, hey, you know, you're healthy, you'll have to do this, you'll have to take care of that, and, you know, stop running around. And I went, it's got nothing to do with that. It turned out it was some sort of a, uh, a bladder infection at the end of the day. And I went, hmm. well, there you have it, as Freddie Mercury used to say. <laughs> and there you have it. I'm so happy that you are doing well and that, you know, you're, you're healthy and feeling great. And uh, yeah. even with that, you managed to put out a fantastic record still in February. Um, so even with that and uh, the craziness that has been 2020 with the lack of touring, you know, you guys started it out strong with Black Swan. And I do have to say, uh, and I know you're probably sick of hearing it, but it's one of my favorite records that, uh, you know, you have done as of late. And even um, probably one of my favorite records in the last couple of years, you know, Love Jeff, oh. Love Love Rev. Thank you. So what was it like for you finally getting those songs out? Because I'm pretty sure this was a project that was in the works for a little bit of time, right? Uh, you know, it, it initially started out with my name being dropped at Frontiers Records. And I actually had uh, the CEO slash owner of Frontiers call me about 18 months before that going, Robert, we have to do a solo record for you. And I went, I don't want to do a solo record. <laughs> and he goes, no, it, you, you must be on the label. And this is what I would like you to do. And, uh, and, and you know, I had a heavy schedule with, with uh, Shanker Fest and, and I still had the show in Vegas. And, and you know, the, the, the planets did not align at the time. So we put it on the back burner and uh, um, it was a Sunday morning in Vegas and my phone rings and I see Jeff Filson and I said, what do you want? <laughs> And he goes, hey! And of course, you know, I've known Jeff. Jeff was best man at my wedding, for God's sake. Right, you guys have, you guys go way back. Yeah, we go way, way. And, and he was on a MSG Unplugged tour with us. So, 
you know, I know Jeff and his family like forever. And, and he also played on, on the last studio album of MSG, like Macaulay right. Shanker with, with James Kotak. And anyway, so he, he said, look, hey, Serafino called me. He wants me to put a project together. And you're the first guy that I thought about. I don't want to approach anybody else. I want to get your take. And I'm, I've drafted Reb Beachin already. What do you say? And I went, ah, of course I'm in. <laughs> and I said, but there's a precondition. And he goes, what is it? And I said, you have to play bass. And at the time he said, no, 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 that's not part of the deal. I'll produce, I'll help with the co-writing, um, but I want to take a back seat. I have three, four bass players that I'm thinking about right now. And I went, well, you can think all you want. And I said, if you're not playing bass, I, I won't do it. And I said, that's the deal. You, me, Reb, and then we'll decide who the drummer is. And, and he goes, you're impossible. And I said, I tell you what, I'll speak to Reb. <laughs> And I said, so we'll come at you from both sides. And that's kind of what happened. And yes, he did end up playing bass and producing and engineering. And you said it a couple of minutes ago. Um, it's probably my favorite record that I've ever done. And I've, I've, I've done a bunch of different stuff. But the production, the energy level, the fun it was in making it, and the quality of the writing was just, uh, it was just something that, I haven't had a chance to do with that kind of a, a group of people. And Reb's playing is just, people just don't know. I mean, they know him in Whitesnake, they know him in Winger, etc., but they, they don't know Reb Beach playing. He's just, I want to call him an animal, but he's an animal. And he just released actually, I think, uh, an instrumental record I heard a couple yes, of little he's snippets. working on his solo record that I- Yeah, a couple of snippets that. I heard already and it's just, you know, he's just great. So um, what an honor for me. And obviously to get back in the studio, Mr. Pilsen was just a, an absolute blast because I'm surprised we got any work done because, you know, we, we, we would just stop and start chewing the fat about nothing and just laugh and go, do you remember? And I'm like, we, we, we got to get some work done here. But we, we got it done and a great bunch of songs. And we had, uh, thanks to you, uh, we had... Uh, we had some great feedback, some great reviews. So then the pandemic hit and it's, it sort of closed, slapped the door in our face. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Was this something that you guys wanted to like take out for live shows or was it something that um, you guys were kind of just planning to have it be a studio thing, you know, maybe work on something in the future or were you guys trying to actually take this, you know, to, uh, to like across you know, the country? When, when, you, when, when we started it, there was no discussion about should we go live, should we do this? Because Reb's schedule is like stupidly crazy between right. Whitesnake and Winger. Jeff, of course, you know, every day of the year was Foreigner. And, and I had between, between Vegas and, and the Shanker Fest quite a busy time. And plus the fact we're just all over the place. You know, Reb is actually in Philadelphia. And, and um, Pittsburgh, rather. He's in Pittsburgh. And, and Jeff's here, I'm here. And then, of course, when Matt Starr came in, we're, we're kind of very close together. Um, it was very, we knew it was going to be difficult to try and nail us down. And with everybody else's schedule, how, how are we ever going to do that? Right. And so that was, uh, that was a question on everybody's mind. Um, we answered it quite simply by going, of course we want to play live. And given the opportunity, yes, we will. Um, we were not able to give anybody specifics on that other than just, yes, of course we want to do it. Mr. Pandemic entered the scene and went, you know what? None of you are playing live ever again. <laughs> you don't have to worry about any schedules because it's just so completely it's just, cleared. It, 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 it took care of itself and, and oh my God, it's it's... It's, it's such a disaster. It's, it's odd because speaking of disaster, you know, when, when Jeff and Reb sent me the first piece of music, I went, okay, here's something, take your best shot. And so I got it and I'm going, ah, because you, we, we didn't discuss what it was we were supposed to do. Right. Frontiers asked for a classic rock record and I'm going, ah, more of the same, right? No, no veering off to the left or the right, no doing our own thing. And so Jeff said, just let's give him a record. Let's just write and whatever comes out, comes out and forget the, 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 the name tags of classic rock or any other type of rock. So they sent me a track. I came back in. Reb was in from, uh, 
from home and he was at the studio with Jeff. I came over, we were chewing the fat for a bit. And he goes, so what do you got? <laughs> and I said, well, this is what I got. And it's called Big Disaster. <laughs> and he goes, wait, dude. He said, this is the first time we've worked together. The first piece of music and you walk in here and you're calling it Big Disaster. <laughs> what, are people, what are people going to think? And I went, you know, I don't know. I'm not thinking about people. I'm just thinking about this piece of, this piece of work right here. Yeah. And so we, we started to track it. And uh, he goes, oh, dude, just, just keep going. This is great. And that was the end of it. We didn't discuss any more songwriting. And, and ironically, there was no pandemic at the time. And somehow, I guess in the subliminal while writing the lyrics, everything seemed to go down the road of what led to a damn pandemic, you know, from shake the world to big disaster. A real to, big disaster. <laughs> you're right. To make it there to, and I'm going, oh my God, you know, like divided, united. And I'm going, how did we know people were going, oh, they must have got a, a memo from the gods. <laughs> so it was a strange irony that the entire album had those sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> prophecies, <laughs> if you will. I don't know. It's funny how stuff happens, you know. Well, it's so cool because I actually was just listening to this record the other day. And I mean, music is always, you know, subjective. But I remember, you know, I would listen to Big Disaster. And for the longest time, it like meant something different to me. Right. And then I listened to it in a completely different other light. And it like the lyrics applied to a completely different like other situation in the world. And I was like, this is... This is interesting. So yeah. yeah right, right. And then when we, uh, I think um, um, Shank the World was the very last song that we actually wrote. <clears throat> and we decided, <clears throat> excuse me, having put the whole thing together, we needed a track that was sort of this kind of a tempo and, and blah, blah, blah. So they, they shot that over to me. And I only have had two days a week off from Vegas. I'd have Thursday, Friday, and Jeff would be screaming, what's the schedule? What's the schedule? Because I'm actually not home this week and you're home next week and, and we just can't get it. So we would scramble every hour that we were in the same place at the same time to try and work. So they shot me this track and I remember getting it at some ridiculous hour of the night and Jeff goes, can you come over tomorrow? And I went, I haven't even heard the track yet, you know? <laughs> and um I remember scrambling and just going, I have no idea what to do with this. No idea. And, you know, I have a habit of sitting on a song for about, about two days. And all I'll do is just put it in repeat. And I won't even attempt to come up with a melody. This just shot out the gate. And I went, ah, there's something. And I came back into him and he goes, well, this is the title track then. And I went, it is? And he goes, this is going to be great. We worked on it for, we would always do a little pre-production. I'd sit with him in the control room and we would iron out a couple of little changes, tweaks, and I'd go straight to the mic and start recording and I'd leave the studio when the song was done. And usually we'd work three or four hours and we'd get all backing vocals and everything done in that time. And uh, it turned out great. It's a, it's a kick-ass track and very lyrically it's like, it it gets it makes its point <laughs> and it was a video it was the first video too yes so yes i know it was the first video you guys released because you guys did a couple of them um you know one of my favorite songs off the record um is immortal souls i feel like good it's, girl <laughs> oh. it's it's so i remember the first time i heard it it's one of those songs that just gets the chorus just gets you it stays stuck in your head um so is there a story behind that one what was the process like of getting that one together well you know i i Again, they would, they would like, as fast as they could, they would just keep throwing stuff at me. And uh, I'm a huge vampire fan. I love vampire movies. I love all the first book I ever read in my life. My dad, God rest his soul, gave me Bram Stoker's Dracula. Wow. First book. First, <laughs> first right? I mean, <laughs> and um, he used to work in a castle because he was like way, way back in the day, he was like a stud groom. So he used to bring in thoroughbred Irish racehorses into the world. So he'd work in this oh. castle, he'd work in this castle stables at the end of this really long, long, 
dark avenue lane. And I mean, if anything was breeding vampires, it was this location. <laughs> and, and he used to read this damn book and then he, he passed it on to me. And I, I couldn't believe that he would be reading such a thing in this kind of an environment this late at night, right? And so I became a big vampire buff. So I came back to Jeff and I said, this song is about vampires and Pilsen, like he said, of course it is. <laughs> But he had no idea that it was. And it really, uh, it really morphed into just a great piece of music. It has such a, it such has a sleazy, sexy guitar solo on it. The pre-chorus into the chorus. And it's a big, it's a big vampire love story. That's all it is, you know. After a thousand years, you know, he still loves her. And, and it's just, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm all about vampires. I did hear a little story that uh, they may release it kind of around Halloween. So Halloween's coming up at the end of the month, just to stick it out there. If they don't, I will post it everywhere anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so catchy. And I feel like that, like the catchiness is just th throughout the whole record. Like I feel like every chorus is like kind of, almost feels like an anthem in some way. Um, and I feel like it really carries them through that song, so. It's one, of, it's one of my, if not my personal favorite track, just purely because of how it leans that direction and it's just, you know, it's yeah. just, anyway, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> now, like, in the process of doing Black Swan, you know, you've been, you've been working over the years with writing the rock vaults. Do you ever sometimes just reflect on how kind of fate entered your life? Because you never really had plans to be a singer, right? It kind of just happened on accident. I'm still not a singer. I'm a wannabe singer. <laughs> I, wanted to be, I wanted to be a great drummer, and I absolutely sucked. I played drums for years. I, I, I started off playing in a sort of little country western band. And I, I, the most I ever did regarding singing was I would do backup vocals because I could hide back there, you know. And uh, I got thrown out front because the singer was sick one night. And, and they were going, you sing the vocals. And I go, I don't want to sing. I'm not a singer. I'm a drummer. I was not a drummer, you know, either. And they said, dude, you should do the singing. And I'm going, nope. I'll see you. I'm going back there where it's safe and I can hide. And I remember uh, because I was born and raised in Ireland and then I, I uh, took a trip to London to visit one of my sisters. And I ended up down the local pub and it was, it was a music pub and I, I, uh, I ended up on stage somehow. And a couple of weeks later, I got an offer to join this pub band. And suddenly I'm singing from nowhere to singing and I'm going, this is wrong, I don't want to sing. And it just cascaded from there into um, the bass player and guitar player that eventually became uh, members of Grand Prix were in the pub one night and they went, hey, you want to come sing some real music? <laughs> and we cut some demos together and uh, we did a couple of gigs and then all of the punk thing explosion broke out in, in the UK. And then there was no more of that. And uh, a year or two later, I get a call from the same guys who had a singer. It's, 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 it's a great story, really, because just this morning I, I was talking to Phil Lanzen, who's the keyboard player from Uriah Heep. Yes. And the singer with Uriah Heep, Bernie Shaw, is the singer that I replaced when I joined Grand Prix. And he's been with Uriah Heep for forever years. And so there's this close knit of people that just seem to circle around each other. And I ended up in Grand Prix and um, I'm currently writing uh, songs that will eventually become uh, a solo record because Frontiers thinks that I should keep the momentum in between the next Black Swan <laughs> record. I I'm also working, don't know. <laughs> I also, right? And, um, and so I, I, I got hold of Phil and I said, you know, Grand Prix will never see the light of day again. You know, it just won't. And I said, let's write a couple of tunes just for the hell of it. And the record label went, that's a great idea. It's the only connection that you'll probably ever be able to make. Yeah. And so, and so Phil and I wrote a couple of tunes. So we're, we're seeing where that goes. And, and it's, it's an interesting process because we haven't written a song together since Grand Prix days. And um, it's been a lot of fun. And I was just talking to him this morning, in actual fact. He accidentally uh, hit the, uh, the video chat button <laughs> on WhatsApp. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, mate. I'm sorry. I'll keep doing this to people. And I'm going, you need to, it's 
it's like late in the day in the UK, and I said, too much wine, Phil, or beer, or whatever it is. <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere. So. It's somewhere always. Isn't that great? I love that. I love that time. But yeah. I mean, yeah, you're here now. It's, you know, been 30 years, and you're Ooh, still making You know your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you're still, you know, making music, and, you know, what is it like for you to see the music that you've done, you know, kind of transcend generations almost, because... You know, oh, I'm, you're very sweet. You're very I mean, sweet. I'm, I'm 20 and, and I, I love this music. And, and, you know, like, what is it like to be playing shows, you know, with Michael Shankerfest and seeing, you know, younger people who are in their, you know, 20s and even, you know, teenagers coming out with, you know, their, their parents to like just embrace this music? You know, what is that like for you? Um, I think it's great because I, honest to God, didn't, didn't and don't expect to be still performing. Um, you know, I didn't, I'm no Bon Jovi or Skid Row or, or Scorpions or anything like that. But, you know, they're all very good friends of mine and, and they're all extremely successful. And we never seem to break through the barrier that they did for whatever reasons. And there's no regrets. I've enjoyed every single bit of it, you know. Um, what I love to see, though, is the younger generation who seem to like classic rock. I have always said, you know, I have two boys, 21 years of age. One of them just screams on guitar. And all he plays is classic rock. And I didn't force it on him, you know. And it's, it's ironic also that, you know, when you see a lot of the big car commercials on TV or you see foam and all of that, it's almost classic rock tunes that they, that they use. It's, it's Pretty it's, much always. Like even in football games too, you know. It's right? Like Pretty much. So what does that tell you about that sort of genre of music? It, it just seems to have, it, it's, it's, it's timeless. You know, it just seems to stick. It seems to definitely stand the test of time. Great songs, great anthems, great sing-along stuff. What is there not to like? The rest of it just, it's, it's, it's come and gone because, you know, it harbors some sort of darkness or something, <laughs> you know? And it was a fad flavor of the week, as I call it, you know? Um, but the classic rock seems to have just gone along. I mean, we walk out and we do concerts. Think about this, you know, I mean, more last year, 2019, as opposed to the dreaded 2020. We're going out and playing festivals to, we, we played Loud Park in Japan like two years ago. 40,000 people, you know, and, and you walk out there and you're going, they're singing songs, kids singing songs from 1988. You know, songs that I sometimes forget the lyrics, so I just keep watching people in the front and I go, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be singing, <laughs> right? It's true. And, 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 and um, it's alive and well. And, and, and the big stage is great for the classic rock bands. It's just, it's just alive. It's just, it's so much energy. And I love going to live shows. I miss the live shows. I just hope to God that we can get back there. There's nothing like walking up on stage in a festival atmosphere because it's just electrifying. It's, it's just, I'm the luckiest guy alive. I mean, not a lot of people get to see it looking out, you know? Right. It's, it's a great spectacle looking up, you know, when the light show is on and everything, but my God, when you walk up that ramp from behind stage and you look out to that sea of people, they're going, I want my mommy. <laughs> And it's 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 the greatest it's the greatest feeling in the world, and I absolutely uh, I love it. It's the best. I remember my dad one time saying, you know, you should join the navy and see the world. And I went, what if I see it from a rock and roll tour bus? <laughs> <laughs> that's good enough for me. I'll I'll go down yeah, that right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not as glamorous as people think it is, but it's not a bad place to be. So I'm I'm very very grateful, and I'm very grateful to people like you who who takes the time to do their podcast and keeping it alive because if it weren't for you i wouldn't be sitting here talking to you and thank you for that thank you i mean something that i wanted to share with you because my mother will also really appreciate this she'll probably be very happy when i show her this you know i grew up listening to all this type of music and and you know like you said about your own sons my parents never forced it on me it was just around and i took a liking to it but when my mother was 20 in the year 1989, um, she worked in a gas station during the night shift, um, a little bit of background, and every night at like three or four in the morning, they would play anytime. Oh. And my mother 
<laughs> would literally dance around the gas station she worked in and would sing anytime into a mop. And it was like her favorite song in the whole world. Um, and now I love Macaulay Shanker group. So, uh, What's your mom's name? Rachel. <laughs> Rachel. Rachel, I love you. <laughs> Yeah, she she loved that song and she loved, you know, all of the records that you guys did. And she uh she was like, nobody knows about this but me. And I was like, I will tell him, I will let him know. <laughs> please, please give her a big hug from me. I will, but I thought that was just such a great example of, you know, my mom loved that music when it came out. And, you know, 30 years later, I love it just as much as, you know, she loved it. And I will pass it on to my children as well. So um I just oh, it was so cool. You know what? Um when you're done, uh, either send to my wife or text an address. We have some anytime promo photos. I'd love to send one. I know that sounds a little pretentious. Please don't. Oh take my this. gosh, it's but, not at all. That I would love. To I would love to. I'll send, I would love to send one to her. Yes, yeah, she. Me to your mom, Rachel. We'll have her a secret singing mop love affair, and I'll get up at three o'clock in the morning, and I'll go to some gas station somewhere, and I. <laughs> We could we could do a live podcast together. She can be in her gas station. She is going to just die when she sees. Please do that, and I'll send. I'll send that. I'll, I'll get that out. That is I would so love kind. To do, I would love to do that. I would love to do that. But yeah, I just thought I would share that story because oh. it's one of those you know things where it's like you said. I think it stands the test of time, and you know all those you know records that you guys did and this music, and um, it's just it's amazing to see too that. As much as I love the stuff that you've done in the past, you know, the stuff with Black Swan too is just so top notch. And I always like to also focus on the stuff that you guys are doing now, because to me, that is the most important. You know, you guys are still working on right. this music and putting things out and it's still just as great as the records that you guys oh, did. And so it's, you're, it's, it's you're really awesome. cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Really quick. I also want to just touch on rating the rock vault as well, because I know that that's been such an incredible part of your career over the last couple of years. Um, and you guys actually just switched venues right before this entire crazy thing happened in Vegas. Yes, we were at the hard rock um, and the hard rock was bought by um, Virgin uh, Richard Branson. Um, and it will, if everything falls into place, according to uh, the calendar, um, November, apparently they will hand over and it will be officially become uh, Virgin Hotels Las Vegas. We moved from there to, the, to Rio and we were at Rio up until the time that this uh, disaster, this big disaster hit. <laughs> um, we don't have a home to go to uh, because Rio's, everything's closed. Um, so I don't know. Um, what's going to fall into place at the end of this. Um, I do know right now that they are into the best of uh, Las Vegas voting. It, it, it ended uh, midnight on Wednesday night. Uh, we've held a number one slot for best of um, for six years, uh, six consecutive years. I believe we're probably the only show of our type. And it is, it's a classic, it's the story of classic rock, obviously. It's the only show of its type that has actually won in six consecutive years. And, you know, when we started this out, uh, we did a showcase, we did like three minute sizzle. We got a gig in Vegas. We thought it would last one weekend. And it just, you know, it just kept rocking and rolling. And it's been an amazing experience, probably if not mostly because of who I personally have had a chance to perform with. I mean, the best of the best, from Doug Aldridge to Tracy Guns to, to uh, Jay Shellen, who's now drumming with Yes, to Howard Lease from Heart, um, and Bad Company, of course, you know, Paul Rogers, my, my hero. Um, we've had Dave Amato from Oreo Speedwagon. Um, we've Andrew Freeman, Paul Tortino, Todd Kearns, Michael T. Ross and Keys, um, two amazing girl singers. Sean Coy, who was out with Meatloaf and Dweezil Zappa, and a girl that was on The Voice, Megan Ruger, just an absolute powerhouses, both of them. So you walk up there to this broads, and Rowan Robertson and get out to play with, with, uh, with Dio, um, Hugh McDonald on bass from Bon Jovi. I mean, you walk up there and you're going, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this kid from, from nowhere in Ireland, and I'm, I'm up there with, with, with these, these like, so, you know, when you walk up there night after night with these guys and you're going, I'm the luckiest kid on the block, no pun intended. Oh, 
and it's it's that that really makes it uh, makes it something really really special. The people in Vegas, you know, um, the, the, it's it's they're always coming and going. It's just a constant constant flow of people from all over the world, and so you get you have the you have the the pleasure of performing to a fresh audience every night. And people go, oh, doesn't it get boring or singing the same set over and over and over? That's as may be, but you have a different audience every night. Right. And, and so they, they in, in them by themselves bring a, a fresh energy and they just, they just elevate you. You, you just, you're, you're constant. The green light goes and you're out, you're out the door. And it's, it's, it's great fun. It's just great fun. And as I said, I think we've hit up to the time we closed um, pre uh, pandemic about 1500 shows wow. going, str going strong so that's uh that's you know some bands don't perform that in a lifetime <laughs> right yeah i mean yeah. is it cool too for you getting to i guess sing songs that i mean aren't part of like your personal catalog you know what i mean like is it is it kind of more I don't want to say, I guess, more fun, but is it kind of just like more freeing to like get to sing songs that you, you know, haven't like sang yes. to death, I guess? Yeah, we don't, we don't sing our own songs. We don't, that's, that's part of the deal because that's a little, that's a little, a little pretentious. Plus it's, it's very carefully structured because it has to fall into the classic rock category. People go, oh, you don't do any deal. You don't do any of this. And they go, it's not classic rock. Right. We don't do Beatles. We don't do we do a couple of stones, you know, we do doors, we do the who, we do a couple of Bon Jovi tunes, we do leopard, you know, um, queen. That's the, that's the area Fleetwood Mac. We fall into all of those categories that we keep a classic rock. And, and people are always asking for a new song. They're always asking for more. And from the time we start, we, we must have been, we were running at two hours and 40 minutes, the show. First time we performed it. And of course the casinos like you, 90 minutes on the dot and open up the casino because that's that's what they're there for to gamble right. not to listen not to listen to music music is purely a side project you know <laughs> for the casinos but we we have a very very broad extensive set of material and people you know it's 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 a show so every time you change the song you have to change the the lights everything is it's it's, right. it's like a, it's like a machine that's constantly moving and we're all parts of that machine and it's like a teamwork. That's what, that's what keeps it flowing. There's no, it's about the show. At the end of the night, it's about the show. And, and I think that's what makes it work. We work for each other, with each other, together for it. And it just, it comes across like that. And we, we have a blast. We took it to the UK last year for a week just to test the waters. And the promoters loved it, the crowds loved it. And we had so many people in the UK that had seen it in Vegas and they all came out to see it. We even had people from Holland and Germany and Sweden who actually flew into the UK. Even people from Australia wow. made a special. I mean, it's, it's nuts. It's up. And it's, again, it's going back to what we were saying earlier, uh, how classic rock music still has such a very, very broad appeal to all age groups. And it's an all age show. So, People just don't seem to get, to, and of course, there's so much to choose from. There's such a wealth of great songs. I mean, you, you never run out of material to perform. That's what's, that's what's great. And you don't have to write it. It's already there, you know. Yeah, you guys, you guys change up the set, too. So, like, it, it still falls under that category, but you guys always. actually change it up. Okay. Yeah, always. So, um, it's great. At some point, you're going to hear your favorite tune. And, and you know, there's, there's, there's all of the different singers. We're, we don't pretend to be Robert Plant or, 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 or Steve Perry or, 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 or Steven Tyler. What we do is we, we can mix up one song with two or three singers. So everybody takes parts and that's how we make it. You know, what's important is the integrity of the song. That what you hear, and musically, it's exactly like the record. And then the singers come out and we put our take on it. And, and before you know it, everybody's going, it sounds like the record. And that's, that's the whole idea is to really keep the strength and the integrity of the song for the audience, you know, and our job is, is, is to, uh, is to maintain that sort of level night after night. And it's, it's not easy because, because the pressure is on, they come to see the show and they want to see a show and uh, our job is to give them a show and so far so good. Yeah. I am hoping that, 
once life resumes normalcy, if we could <laughs> say normalcy, yes. whenever that come and see us. Whenever that may be, I'd love to uh, come out and see you because uh, that's you know, like you said, so many um, musicians I know have been a part of this project, yeah. and uh, yeah. like I just spoke to um. Tony Franklin, who I believe did work with. Oh, yeah, yes. he was just on the podcast. So, you know, Tony's been a part of it. So many people. So uh, it's yes, definitely I on my I forgot Tony. I apologize, Tony. I forgot. <laughs> Tony is phenomenal. You know, I did a little uh, piece of trivia many years. Well, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago. I did a project. I was part of a project that Tony played bass on. It was a project called Bleed. It was very heavy. We had Greg Bizonette play drums and a guitar player called Dave Bates, who's now with a band called Edge of Paradise on Frontiers. And you mentioned Anytime, and all the labels would go, I don't hear Anytime on this record. And I'm going, well, that's not the kind of record it is. So they wouldn't let me, they would not let me move out of my little safety box. They wanted to hear Anytime over and over and over again. I went, no. This is not what this is. This is completely yeah. different. And they, they just weren't having it. So you can't, sometimes you just can't. It's like being typecast, you know? Right. It's like, no, this is what you do. Stick with it. What's People the fun in that, though? What's the fun in, oh. in having the variety, you know? like. And I love wearing different hats. That's what music <laughs> is, you know? There's so many yeah. chords, you know? And, and, and you can write a lot of different songs with three chords Bob Dylan did it you know and so you can wear many different hats but sometimes they just they just don't want you to move away from that 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 safety line that they they put you in a bag you know and I don't like bags you know there's, an, <laughs> there's enough old bags <laughs> oh dear anyway <laughs> that's really cool I actually had no idea about that he was uh just on the podcast I spoke to him on Wednesday. Uh, so that's super cool. Yeah, I had no idea. That's yeah, he's amazing. Nice he's, piece. he's just amazing. He's, and the nicest person. I remember seeing The Firm um, in Wembley with Tony and, and Jimmy Page, Paul Rogers, and of course, Chris Lade, who was the drummer with uh, ACDC. So I've, I've seen some great stuff. <laughs> Never did see Zeppelin live, although I did appear on the same TV show with Robert Plant one time. Yes, you guys was, did. You did Stairway to Heaven with Farquhar. We did Stairway to Heaven, and he was, he was on the same show, and he scared the crap out of everybody because, <laughs> because he's pointing his finger at the back of my head going, what is that? And I'm going, don't look at me. <laughs> yeah, we have dozens of photos together with Robert Plant. It's just the coolest thing, you know? Yeah. That's great. Because Stair, Stairway was never a single at least not from Zeppelin anyway. So um, and I think in the UK alone, I think Far Corporation sold over 2 million singles at the time. Well, that's yeah, when I, Schenker heard of you, right? He, he, he saw it. Schenker, uh, um, I had actually turned Schenker down about uh, three years before that. Right, that was a famous story. Everybody yes. said you to- Yes, to and then the Rudolph part. heard it. Rudolph heard it. Rudolph's going, huh? Oh, I think maybe <laughs> we have to get a hold of this singer. And Micah goes, yeah. Get a hold of him. He already turned me down before. We used to have this Grand Prix and uh, Michael Schenker group were on, were on Chrysler's records together. So I knew Michael and knew Chris Glenn, Cozy Powell. So we, we were stable mates. And um, they came out to see a Grand Prix show one night. I got offered to come to the studio and we were leaving for tour the next day. We actually did the, uh, we were the opening act for uh, Sammy Hager's uh, Stanley Hampton tour of the UK and I said, can't do it. I gotta go touring tomorrow. And then I got all this really bad press that I was some young Irish upstart refusing to join Michael Schenker group. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and who the hell did, they, did I think I was? And I'm going, but I'm working, I have a band. <laughs> yeah, at that point, you know, like you have a commitment, you're, you're going out on tour with Sammy Hagar. It's a pretty big opportunity. Yeah, it's rock and roll, yeah. Why, you know, why, why give it up to, to join, you know, the unknown sometimes, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, and, and it wasn't unknown. I knew exactly what those guys were like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stupid, stupid is what stupid does. <laughs> but anyway, you know, um, again, ironic, four years later, almost to the day, um, I get the call from uh, Rudolph's. Because they were all Scorpions and MSC were, had that point, all the same management company. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they said, please come to Hanover and just come for the weekend. And I went, is this the same offer from four years ago? <laughs> I said no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But of course, I had, a, I, had a, I had a top five single at the time. So it was like, right. it was a lesser risk for them, a bigger risk for me. 
Uh, and anyway, out of that came Macaulay Shanker. You know, there's another story. <laughs> yeah. That's so great. I've kept you on here a long time, but before I let you go, one last Please. thing. Um, at the end of every single one of my interviews, I do basically five questions. I call it the metal from the inside five. It's just five questions Oops. I ask everybody. Um, and you can either answer them fast or think about them. There's no, uh, I guess, rules to it. But okay. the first question is, if you weren't uh, in the profession that you're currently in, so vocalist, uh, what do you think you'd be doing? Oh, um, short story. Um, I grew up uh, as a cabinet maker. I used to make Queen Anne furniture, Chippendale, Regency furniture. I love working with my hands. I love to see a beginning, a middle, and an end. I used to be a really good chair maker, so they tell me. Um, I love furniture, I love architecture. Um, and then I got into computer graphics when my boys were born because there was no rock and roll at the time. And I was actually a senior production artist for a manufacturing company for hair and makeup. So um, I'd probably go down those roads. I, I, love, I love artsy fartsy stuff and I love something that's creative. So I'd probably stick with that. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't know you actually got into the uh, graphic design work. That's yeah. All right, so the second question is, what is something that you wish everybody knew about you? Oh, dear God. <laughs> I am not an interesting person. Um, There's gotta be oh, some kind of a secret, secret talent or something you've got. <laughs> oh, I'm a really good whistler. <laughs> um, you know, I'm... I'm uh, I'm very private outside of, even though I yak a lot, but, but outside of music, um, I keep pretty much a very low profile. Um, I love family. Um, you know, I'm one of 10 kids. I'm always talking to my brothers and sisters. Um, and uh, I love being out in the garden. I don't have a huge garden, but I'd like to just, I go, I go very much the opposite direction. And I listen to a lot of uh, old Irish traditional music. And that's sort of, it, it takes me, take me away. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah it, sure it, not very interesting, not very interesting outside of music at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. And I'm sure listening to that type of music as well, too, you know, kind of gets you in a different oh, frame of me, mind. It, it makes me very emotional. You know, <laughs> Piney Guinness and old tr Irish traditional music. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so number three is if you were stranded on a desert island, and this always gets everybody, this always this question gets everybody every single time, so I'm curious to see what you have, but if you were stranded on a desert island and you only had three records to bring with you to listen to, what would they be? Um, I'd probably take a good Irish traditional record with me because somehow I would manage to have a bottle of rum. I hate rum, but I'd find something, you know, pirates, you know, I'd be desert, I'd be stranded. Um, <laughs> I'd for sure probably take some Zeppelin and some Free. Nice. And then I, I kind of covered it that way. You know, I got a little blues rock. I've got the... Yeah, you got, got a little bit of everything. Got I got rock. the metal and then I can get drunk at the end of the night when I'm listening to the Chieftains or something. <laughs> yeah, with the rock from the Pirates. It'll yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, number four is what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, um, I, oh, I'm going to quickly jump to, to the way things are in the environment today. Um, it's nasty. It's very mean. There's a great, great lack of respect, if any at all. No respect at all. My mom, God rest her, always used to say, if you grow up, always remember it costs nothing to say please and thank you. It costs nothing. And I've always told my boys that very same thing and it's just part of just be respectful try to be a nice person nobody likes a nasty person there's no need to be an evil nasty just bad-mouthed just I, I have no time for negativity I just it doesn't belong in my life so if you can just cocoon that kind of stuff you know be nice to others be nice you wouldn't want anybody to be nasty to you, so don't be nasty to them. I think that's a biblical statement. Do unto yeah. others as you, as you would have them do unto you. And they, if you live by that, life's not going to be so bad. You know, nothing, it, life doesn't come with a manual. When I had my kids, well, I didn't have my kids, my wife did. Um, they didn't come with a manual either, but, but I learned a lot from my, from my own upbringing. And it was never that easy, but I did okay, you know. 
Stop bitching about it and be a nice person. Look at you, beautiful 20 year old young woman and your mom knows how to sing into a mop at three or four <laughs> o'clock in the morning. I'm telling you, that's some good living right there. And I mean that in the nicest possible way, you know? And it's, it's come on, it's, it's all good, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, I love that. And it's, it's reminding me too, just when you said that of like, like you said, it costs, it costs nothing to be a nice person. It costs nothing no. to be kind. No. To, you know, everybody's dealing with something and going through yeah. something and, you know, why, why add to that? You know, just. Yeah. yeah. We have such a habit of going, that guy is such an ass. You don't know what that guy is going through. Right. You have, you have no right. You have no idea what happens to him when he puts his or her when they put their head down on their pillow, if they have a pillow. So you don't know. So be, be less judgmental about people, you know, yeah. and just, 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 you know, radiate something positive. That's all you have to do, man. <laughs> That's one of my favorite questions to ask too, because I'm a sucker for inspirational stuff. So whenever I ask that question, it's like, I like internalize it. So that's, that's really great. Um, the last question I have for you is something that's kind of on the less serious, more fun side. Um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Oh my God, I've asked myself that. You know something, we, we're big into power movies, right? And, and all, all, of the, all of the galactical heroes. And I always used to think, which would be better? Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Captain America. You know, how could you be that sort of all encompassed, I can do everything. Um, you know, there's only one God. And if, you know, if he has the last word, I'm okay with that. So I don't, I don't need to be this like superhero, you know? Um, somebody much more powerful than me is, is able to make a much more calculated decision on anything that I could possibly even conjure up. So yeah, God's my, God's my superhero. Well, I am so happy that you took the time to join me on the podcast. This was like, not even gonna lie, it's like a bucket list one for me. So I'm so happy that oh, you joined. Oh, you are so sweet. <laughs> and you have been so gracious and, and, and Thank you for taking the time on your Friday morning. Your Friday, what time is it with you? It's your three um, hours? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, well, it's, thank you so much. It, honestly, probably one of my favorites that I've done. And my mom will be ecstatic. And again, all the love to Gina and everything. Thank you so things. much. I will pass it along. You're beautiful. Stay beautiful. Stay well. Stay safe. And uh, I'm here anytime you want to talk. Anytime. <laughs>